Welcome to Engaging Culture, a podcast presented by Bridgeway Christian Church. I'm Brian Kiley, and today Pastor Lance Hahn and I welcome Dan Burns to the show. Dan served as a professor of chemistry at Sierra College for 40 years, and on this episode, we'll be talking about faith and science. Do faith and science have to be at odds with one another? How can our faith influence the way we talk about science, and how can science influence the way we think about faith? What can the natural world show us about God? These questions and more on this episode of Engaging Culture. Well, hello, welcome to Season 1, Episode 23 of the Engaging Culture Podcast. Brian Kiley, joined by Pastor Lance Hahn. Lance, how are you? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm great. Feeling good after Easter? Yeah, you know what? Actually, yesterday, um, you know, coming off some of these Easter pieces, usually I'm brain dead. And then I actually took a day. We went for a whole bunch of walks, which I usually avoid physical activity. <laughs> and so we took a whole bunch of walks out in the beautiful, bright sunshine, which the East Coast probably does not want to hear. And it was awesome. And so I feel ready to go. Although, uh, I, I'm not sure my body's as ready to go as my mind is. Well. So anyway, I feel good. I'm ready to go. And I'm excited about today. Me too. Uh, yeah. Mr. Dan Burns is kind of a big deal in my life. Uh, when he and Paula, uh, first had come to the church, they kind of knit their way into my heart. So I take them very personally and I follow all their travels around the world and, uh, <laughs> they send me postcards and everything. So anyway, I think just having him as a friend here on the show is pretty awesome. I agree. Speaking of that, Dan, good morning. Well, good morning. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for uh, taking some time uh, to come and, and uh, be with us and be on the show and talk faith and science with us. We've had a fun time already this morning hearing about all your all your travels, but uh, um, we're looking forward to just you sharing a little bit about kind of your career as a scientist, your, obviously your life as a believer, and the way that those two kind of aspects of, of you uh, interact and how they can kind of be helpful to our, our listeners, sort of wherever they are in their faith journey and then wherever they are in their understanding of kind of the natural world and science and everything uh, everything like that. So can you share with us, Dan, just, just as we get started, uh, share a little bit of your professional background with our listeners. I'd love to, Brian. Uh, well, I uh, started out my uh, college career at uh, Westmont College in uh, near Santa Barbara in Montecito, uh, and took a year there. Uh, it's a Christian liberal arts college, and uh, I really had a, a wonderful time there. Great science classes and wonderful Bible classes gave me a chance to kind of uh, deconstruct my faith and put it back together to be my own, to uh, get really reasons for believing what I believed in terms of the Bible, so that was great. Uh, Paul and I were engaged, so we kind of looked at the whole process and decided, hey, can we do four years here for getting married after my sophomore year? And decided, mm, probably not. So, uh, <laughs> so I left, uh, and went to CSU Chico, which was Chico State back in the day, and, uh, became a chemistry major. And, uh, we were, we got married after my sophomore year and then, uh, we were active in the couple of local churches in the Chico area. And, uh, then I finished up my bachelor's degree in chemistry and did a little stint in the National Guard, then came back and finished up my, uh, master's degree and, uh, had an opportunity to teach a few years at Chico to get some experience. And then the Lord, uh, blessed us with, uh, an opening in uh, Rockland at Sierra College after that. And we took that job, moved down, and I began my teaching career there uh, of 40 years in the chemistry department. And uh, within a couple of years, I was kind of volunteering as the head of the department. And pretty soon I was the department chair when that was something that was actually happening. And I uh, took that advantage of that opportunity to be kind of a servant leader in the department and uh, hopefully uh, display uh, the attitude that Christ would have in that situation, looking out for others and uh, kind of putting myself last. So some semesters I had really terrible schedules, <laughs> but everybody else was happy. And uh, then as the department got bigger, it was you know something that we could all work through and, and had a great schedule. Uh, and then later on, I uh, did a master's degree in education at National University. Uh, and so that's kind of my uh, professional background. Fantastic. Can you? I want to go back to something you said right at the very beginning, because I'm, I'm curious about it, only because you used a word 
that I'm finding is kind of a buzzword right now in a lot of Christian circles, a lot of podcasts I listen to talk about this idea. Uh, and, and, and this was just such a, such a small point in the whole thing. So, so uh, forgive me for keying in on it, but you talked about as a college student having the opportunity to deconstruct and then reconstruct your faith. Can you say a little bit more about that and maybe what role, if any, your scientific education played in that? Or was it just a matter of like, I'm in college now, I'm off on my own, and I need to I need to figure this out for, for me? What, what was that process like? It, it was pretty much just figuring it out for me. Yeah. Uh, it had been, I was raised in a Christian home and always believed. I became a believer uh, when I was in like the second grade. And uh, kind of similar to Pastor Lance's story of always, you know, knowing about God and God was always there and always believing the Bible. And uh, then when I was at Westmont, I was exposed to some ideas that were different than mine. You know, I was raised pre-trib and that I got these really great post-trib uh, arguments. I thought, wow, well, why am I believing what I believe? You know, let's check this out. Uh, so it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Kind of questioning not it does god exist but what does the bible say and why do i believe what i believe is it just because i was taught that or it's that exactly what the bible says on this topic yeah you know i i would have to say that i feel like personally every believer has to go through that type of process now it doesn't mean it has to be in college and organized right. and all that but everybody has to own it. And in order to own it, you have to have certain questions answered that are important to you, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe some people are a little bit more intellectual, so they're going to lean into kind of the the apologetic side of things. Right. Um, but there's a lot of people that are more practical, mm -hmm. right? And all they want to know is, does this work, mm -hmm. right? And so they have to go through an issue. Sometimes it happens through crisis, um, all of a sudden they, they're, uh, someone that they love is sick mm -hmm. and they need to understand mm -hmm. whether or not prayer is real, whether or not God is real. Mm -hmm. But every believer has to have some type of doubt processes that keep going through their mind. You know, I remember, mm -hmm. uh, something I think I've shared on this podcast before, but, um, I heard a pastor say, we're always in the process of rebelieving. That mm -hmm. every day you're rebelieving mm -hmm. because you're yeah. saying, no, 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 I believe this is true. I believe this is true. And even in an assessment, I believe this is true. And so anyway, I just, you had it a little bit more um, clear cut and it does tend to hit a lot of people with in college. Right. Because you're finally getting new ideas. It's not always just what mom, dad, and the church that we go to says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. So Dan, tell us a little bit about... Uh, how has your faith influenced your career as a science professor, and how has just the fact that you are more educated in the sciences, specifically chemistry, than 99% of the population or something? I don't have the hard data in front of right. me, but something like that. Sure. Uh, how has your career as a scientist and a science professor influenced the way you've thought about uh, your faith? Kind of two, two sides of that. Share a little bit about that. Right. Well, because uh, I was raised in a Christian home and because I believe the Bible is the Word of God— uh, I always believed that God was the creator and that uh, life is a direct result of his creation. Uh, so even in my early days in high school when I would be confronted with evolutionary theories, uh, I recognized that those were simply human explanations that attempted to explain what was going on around us without God as part of the explanation. And since I knew that God was part of the explanation, I simply felt, well, I've got more information than they do, and so it makes a lot more sense to me than to them, because they're trying to work out a problem without all of the resources. Right. Uh, so that's how I have always approached it. I never felt challenged by the whole evolutionary argument, uh, because I recognized its inherent weaknesses. Mm. Uh so it was nothing that shook my faith in any way. Uh, so from the very beginning, teaching at Sierra, when we would talk about uh, the atom and uh, possibly origins just a little bit in chemistry but not very much, uh, I would simply bring up you know, what, what makes more sense that um, energy and matter have always existed or that – we are the result of a creator who brought all of this into being. 
You know, so something has to be eternal. It's either God or energy and matter. And as we'll find out later in the podcast, uh, the latest science says that matter is not eternal. Mm-hmm. That matter came into existence at some point in time. And with that as the latest scientific theory, uh, folks who hold scientific materialism as their worldview are hard pressed to explain how matter came into existence. Right. So Christians are actually in an excellent position with an explanation for anyone who's questioning that, that idea. Unfortunately, most people don't think enough about the origins and they always think, tend to think that science has already explained this. There is a natural explanation and they'll say, well, it's explained by evolution or it's explained by this or that. But in reality, it's not. Okay. There, there is no scientific materialistic explanation for the existence of life or the origin of matter. So uh, this is this is me going into pop culture a little bit, um, but growing up, probably one of the most popular, brilliant men mm-hmm. has been Stephen Hawking, who right. recently just passed away. Right. Um, of course, he has kind of been relatively outspoken, or at least quoted as such, as really not being a believer. Right. Not not following the Lord, not having a, right. a, a God. He writes books called The Theory of Everything. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you know, he's Free history of time. Yes. Yeah, so he's he's really talked a lot about origins and stuff like that. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't know enough about his works, mm-hmm. but um, because he recently passed away, he's you know, it's it's really on right. everybody's mind. But tell me a little bit about what you know of the things that he has brought up and how people are dealing with these you know, because it used to be the Big Bang, right? right? That was always the conversation. Right. Big Bang, Big Bang, Big Bang. Um, and then the Christians go, yep, God said it, and bang, it happened, right? right. And so, I mean, there's all these kind of things. Right. But it's gotten far more complicated than that when people start talking about uh, the level that Hawking was talking. Correct. So, so give us a little insight there. Well, he was able to solve some of the uh, theoretical equations that Einstein put forward. And uh, because of the Hubble telescope, Things we found out about at the universe. We now know the universe has not always existed. We know that it is expanding uh, and it's increasing in its rate of expansion. So it can only be a one time thing. So the idea of the universe coming into existence is now a scientific reality. It has a beginning. The problem for materialistic scientific materialism uh, how do you explain the beginning? Yeah. You know, what is the cause? Now, the Big Bang is not a cause, nope. right? It's yeah. a result. So what caused that result? Again, only worldviews like uh, theism have a good explanation for that origin of matter. Uh, so Stephen Hawking, you know, put together this uh, work through the equations, came up with this idea that the universe had a singularity. That means at time, a starting point in time, that's when time began. Before that, there was no time. And matter came into existence at that time. That's when time began. Uh, and then his explanation was originally, and I don't know how that happened. He got a lot of pressure, and he said, well, because the universe exists, it must have created itself, which makes Absolutely no sense scientifically. It's probably the dumbest thing he ever said. Right. You know, it just, because it exists, it had to come into existence. It must have done it itself. It must have self-created. But it didn't exist before it created itself. Which doesn't, yeah. Yes, doesn't compute, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you're, you're left with a real dilemma if you push it all the way back. Now, that's not where biologists like to start. They like to start with living things. Yeah. And then they have a pseudo explanation for how you get everything from there. Yeah. But they don't want to start with where did life come from? Even the most outspoken, uh, antagonistic atheists like, uh, Dawkins. Right. Uh, when pushed in the, the movie, I don't know if you ever saw that, uh, uh, no, no intelligence allowed was called. Uh, yeah. I Expelled. remember hearing about it. Yeah. Yeah. 2008, I think it came out. Uh, he was pushed on that documentary, Where Did Life Come From? And he says, well, we don't have a good answer for that, uh, and we can't figure it out on Earth, so it must have come from somewhere else in space. 
Right. So, so what is that? <laughs> it's, it's pushing it off, right? <laughs> yeah. We can't explain it here, but obviously it must have happened somewhere. Came from an outside source. Outside source to Earth. Well, you but know, not outside the universe. Still within the universe, and certainly not from God. Right. According to him. According right. to him. Yeah. Right. And and that's why you know there was two phrases that locked into my mind early on about God and origin things, and that that He is the uncaused cause. Right. And the prime mover. Right. Mm-hmm. And those two phrases you'll hear me mention from the pulpit right. periodically. Those are the two that pop in most common, because what Christianity teaches um, is that that God has no beginning right. and no end. He is outside of our system. So whatever our system is, and I don't think we yet know fully what our system is. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to continue to learn that over time right. because, you know, science really does a lot of examination. Mm-hmm. doesn't give you a lot of right. answers, but it does a lot of examination. Mm-hmm. But whatever our system is of what we would call life, mm-hmm. that is a contained system. Right. And something outside of that, we would say that God lives outside of that. He does not operate by the rules in here. So when you say, where did God start from? You're asking the wrong question. Right. Because that is an inside the bubble question. Right. Only things inside the bubble have starts. Right. Things outside the bubble do not have starts. Right. So that's why you were talking about how Christianity is so properly prepared. Right. For the discussion of the origin of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. Sorry, bro. I just no, no, that's fine. That's great. Took that's off that's on interesting the... stuff. Well, and like you said, I mean, obviously, the, the, I, I think these questions are, are kind of always in the cultural consciousness on some level, but probably to a heightened degree now with uh, you know the passing of, of Stephen Hawking. I mean, you know, when prominent figures right. pass, their ideas are kind of you know raised up again, and obviously he's been influential in, in a number of ways. So mm-hmm. it's worthwhile to to talk about here. I'm interested to hear Dan is very. It's it's helpful to hear kind of that side of things, yeah. how your faith has influenced the, uh, your approach to, to science. And I think that's, again, it, it was wonderful to, to hear. I'm curious also, I, I think about uh, different different scientists whose, whose work I've read or, or, or who are believers. Like, for example, uh, I think about Francis Collins, how he talks about how he has always said to him, scientific discovery is an opportunity for worship. Absolutely. Which, which I find to be a very beautiful expression of kind of, you know, we, we discover things and it, and it helps us understand God more. It reveals the creativity of God. H- how have you experienced that in your own, uh, in your own life, in your, your academic career? Wow. Uh, science is an attempt to explain what we observe. And the farther down you drill in looking at, uh, anything, whether it's chemistry or whether it's the, cosmos and uh you find more and more evidences of of the design that god put there whether it's the the scope of the universe with the hubble telescope and all that we've learned there just the uh immensity of it all Mm -hmm. causes you to just reflect wow god is so much bigger than even i can imagine because he has created this heat this a this universe and then when you look at planet earth compare that with the rest of the universe and you look at what we've learned about uh physics and chemistry and interactions of particles and energy uh and we recognize there are certain laws that are in existence with gravity and electromagnetism and so forth that we've discovered and we discovered those because we look for them. We look for them because the early scientists believed that God was a creator, an intelligent mind, rational, that was going to produce a rational universe, mm-hmm. something that had meaning that you could understand if you were to investigate it. If you didn't believe that there was a creator with a rational mind and that everything was random, why would you look for patterns? Or any questions of why. Or why. Uh, So as we've studied something, let's go to chemistry, that's my my thing. Uh, The the smallest unit of any (coughs) matter is an atom. And originally that's what they thought, that it wasn't any smaller. And then we found that atoms are made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Right, three fundamental particles, and we're thinking, wow, that's pretty pretty wonderful. And you've got only 100 plus elements, only about 80 something that are naturally occurring and everything around us is made up of those. Mm-hmm. Then you go down, you look at the atom. We've now found in uh, particle physics that there are over a hundred elemental particles smaller than the atom. 
You're going, wow. <laughs> Whether you go with a huge expanse of the universe or you go drill all the way down to things you can't even see, and it, they're called quirks, and you've yeah. got these different combinations, and it's like, and they have properties like par- charm and color and spin, and you know that we add just because we're trying to make sense yeah. out of it. It is so complicated, so complex, and we can see how things work. But when we ask the question "why," mm-hmm. we usually end up with, uh, "That's it. That's it." Uh, yeah. It, how does gravity act at a distance? You know, how does one, how does that mass know this mass is there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then you read verses in the Bible. It says that that Jesus holds its whole <laughs> creation together, and you realize, yeah, you want to know why? It's because there's a Creator, and He's yeah. created all this. And in our finiteness, we can't even possibly understand what we can observe and interact with when we ask why. Mm-hmm. All we can understand is if I do this, this is going to happen because the law. This law says that's going to happen. If I jump off of a building, I'm going to fall to the ground and die. It's a law of gravity, okay? But there are other laws like aerodynamics. If you know, maybe I'm going to have a parachute. You know, mm-hmm. so there's other things that can happen that interact with each other. But God is the one who controls all of that. So when He creates and when He uh, intervenes in our natural world with supernatural events, right? He can do so by violating the laws that he set up because he set them up. Yeah, he's he in charge. Cost, so when so when he created, people say, well, there's all these light years, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, God can just speak, and it's there. So how he actually did it, how he actually created the universe, the Bible doesn't say other than that he spoke it into That's existence. Right. Uh, but you know, we're at a loss to, we can't, we can't actually observe that event, nope. Because obviously it happened before. So that's why when you talk origins, it's a different kind of science yes. than when you talk chemistry right. or biology, because you're observing things that are happening now right. and predicting things that are happening now. So when you talk origins, it's perfectly responsible scientifically to look for explanations that are not materialistic for events that are beyond our scope of observation. So we, we don't look and some people say, Oh, you you Christians are always just a miracle here, a miracle there, and you know, I mix these two chemicals together and it didn't happen it that way because some miracle happened. No, we don't say that ever happens because it's a natural observable observable phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh just a side note a question for that. So um I remember hearing something a while back, so it's it's old information. Mm-hmm. So um that I, when you think about what holds together the protons, protons, I'm saying that right, electrons and neutrons, what is the smallest bonding agent that we do know as of now? It used to be called nuclear energy that was a bonding agent back in the day. That was like a cheap answer for it. What holds that stuff together? What are we aware of now? You said there's a 100 things smaller than the atom. Right. And now we know ultimately – the Lord is holding things together. Right. But as you ask the question, I think that science helps us understand how God's doing it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like little explanations of how right. he's doing it. But what do we know now as the smallest glue? What is the smallest glue that holds matter together? Well, actually, we don't know. What We can only call it uh, a force. Okay. okay. So like when uh, two masses attract like the, yes. the earth and the, the moon – we don't know how they're held together. We can describe the interaction that's based on the two masses, the distance between them, yep. gravitational constant. Right? Yes. So we don't explain how that happens. Right. Right. They postulate things like gravitons, but nobody ever has ever found a graviton. Right. Right. So in the nucleus, they're just neutrons and protons. Mm-hmm. But protons repel each other because they're both positive. Right. And there's a strong nuclear force that holds all of them together. Yes. And we can we can put together what the constant is and how that works and the distances and all that stuff. So we can measure that, but we don't know how that force right. is energized other than it appears that the mass of the nucleus is less than the mass of the protons and neutrons, that matter is being changed into energy according to Einstein's equation equals mc squared, and that energy is what's holding it together. But how it does it, we have no idea. No idea. Yeah. Okay. I got. I just yeah, got to geek out there for a second. Sorry. But no, but that's but that's, that's, that's the good. part you were talking about. How my 
your science faith. informs my faith. Yeah. When I see this, it's like I just marvel at who God is and how great he is and how powerful he is. Well, and that's really the the beauty of it to right. me. I mean, I, I think about, okay, so I'm obviously not a scientist. Surprise. I mean, the last <laughs> science, I think the last science class I took was like a microbiology class my sophomore year of college. So it's been, it's been a bit, but I even think about as a lay person, uh, unlike my colleague to my right here, I really enjoy the outdoors. Why? <laughs> I enjoy the outdoors too. You do too. And, I understand. And, and I, I was sharing with Pastor Lance just as we were, talking about this episode, how for me to get outside in beautiful places provokes a sense of wonder in me that is deeply spiritual. Yeah, wonder you know, and awe. That mm-hmm. it, that it uh, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. Like mm-hmm. that, I, I see that. I Even as I'm speaking this to you, I think about, you know, standing in the middle of the, you know, the Narrows in Zion National Park with thousand foot, foot rock faces. Beautiful, I think about standing on the top of Vernal Falls or standing on the top of Half Dome at Yosemite and looking out. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it, it, it really does. It, 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 turns me back to work. I mean, it is a worshipful moment. God, this, these things you have made, you know, standing at the bottom of the Grand right. Canyon, you know, all and on I could go. I, I just, I, I can only imagine how much greater it must be as, as you begin to understand the natural world more. And I love what you said about how, whether you get real, real small, right. and see like, Oh my gosh, or you see real, real big right. to see the complexity, to see the creativity of mm-hmm. God is is amazing and to see as we as we understand more and more about the natural world that that I think there's an apologetic side of it no question about right. it but at the same time there's just a an awe and wonder mm-hmm. side of it too mm-hmm. kind of god this is the universe you have made and it is spectacular it, right. that, that's just I, I have to imagine the more the more you understand you know I I watch documentaries occasionally mm-hmm. right so I don't understand much uh but I, I I the more you understand I have to just imagine the more it provokes a sense of awe at God's power and creativity Certainly in a believer. Yeah. And, and yeah. unfortunately, that doesn't often happen with non-believers. Sure. Right. Uh, and I believe it's because if they recognize there is a God, then they recognize there's a responsibility that they have to that God. Yeah. And they don't want that. Yeah. There's a so number. even though all mankind, as it says in Scripture, should be drawn to him by creation. Mm-hmm. I think that's Romans, Romans right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll leave the... <laughs> the odds are good, but I'm pretty sure it's Romans. Anyway, so so we're at we're all without excuse, but that right. doesn't mean people don't ignore the evidence. That's right. So y- you shared something with us that I thought was kind of interesting uh, as we were preparing for the episode, Dan, and that is you you said how there were a number of uh, of other believers on the the chemistry faculty with you when you were teaching. Obviously, there are Christians and the sciences all over the place. Um, but to have that many believers in the department in a secular uh, institution, I, I don't have a sense of how common that is. But uh, what was that like having fellow believers in the department with you as a as a as a professor? What was that working environment like? It was really fantastic. Uh, and not only were there fellow believers, but all of the non-believers were non-antagonistic towards mm. God and believers. So that's relatively unusual. That's not true for the whole campus. Uh, there are some pretty antagonistic folks there uh, still and, and in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some classes when I was first teaching, say the first 10 years ago, there were philosophy instructors that would ask if there were any Christians in the room, have them raise their hand, have them stand up, and then say to the class, look around, these are the fools that are in this classroom. And when we're done with them, they won't believe anything that's in the Bible. Or anything about God, right in the class, you know. Yeah. So it was that kind of event that was occurring, and I challenged it with the dean, and he said, "Yeah, he's a popular instructor." Uh, so it's kind of like, do what you want. Uh, so I realized, hey, if they have that kind of latitude in their classroom, right? What about my classroom? So I became more emboldened. Yep. As I, uh, as my career went on, to to share more openly with my students as opportunities arose and as the material warranted. So it wasn't like every day I was bringing up God. Right. Sometimes he didn't fit into what we're talking about exactly with, you know, reactions between chlorine and nitrogen or whatever. Right. Oxygen. Uh, So, but it was wonderful because um, they all knew I was a believer 
And uh, as department chair, I had to make some hard decisions, uh, but they were very supportive. And I'd say that our department was one of the four, as it became later on, a relatively large department. Uh, we had probably some of the best workings and least strife. Uh, and we would, uh, you know, pray together at times over issues that came up. Uh, so it was, it was pretty exciting. Pretty yeah, exciting. That's, that's was, amazing. Yeah. That's yeah and there was one time when, uh, it was graduation. This is back in the day when they did invocations, uh, at graduation and they had a, a minister, you know, lined up to come do it. And the person suddenly dropped out, you know, just right before the graduation. So the president said, uh, go find that Dan Burns. He can pray. <laughs> they come and, I'm in my, my, you know, my regalia there. And they, and I went up and prayed. I did the invocation or the benediction. I can't remember which, but it was the fact that people knew I was a believer. That's right. Uh, That's cool. And uh, it wasn't too long after that they stopped doing the whole invocation thing. I don't know if it had anything to do with me. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> and you closed that season. Uh, it could have been. Maybe I wasn't quite ecumenical right. enough or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm full disclosure, I did three years at Sierra College, just over three years at hey, Sierra College right. while you were an instructor. I did not know you because I was not in the sciences side. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not know many believer uh, professors um, on on my side. Went went on to get a, my AA was at Sierra College, and then I went on and got a BA at Sac State before I went into the master's work and all the other stuff that right. I've done in Christian education. So everything else was just regular, secular education. And um, I, I had a lot of those because I was in the English department and we had the very, very antagonistic, mm -hmm. mean guys um, that would that would call us out and go head to head. And that was the first time I learned that whoever controls the microphone controls the conversation, mm -hmm. that the instructor didn't matter what your point was. They had the last word. Mm -hmm. And so they were controlling all of the dialogue. Right. And so I had a couple. That's where I kind of had to calm down and realize if, if he can always distort whatever I'm about to say, it's not as helpful for me to to try to get into d debate here. But right. but um, uh, let me let me ask you. Let me ask you this question. Uh, so you also, in addition to all the chemistry and things like that, you have done work with faith and reason. Right. right. So and and some of that was through focus on the family materials. You know, right. you can kind of kind of help us understand a little bit more about your facilitation of that and your design of materials. Um, but but in doing so, kind of answer this. What are the most important ideas? Of course, you're going to cover a, a ton. They're going to cover a ton on those videos. Right. But what are the big ones that you when you wrote out the materials, you said, OK, I'm not missing this. This is powerful. Mm hmm. What are those kind of things that you had? Um, I think that uh, the the person who actually did the videos was uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who wrote this book called uh, Signature in the Cell. Uh, and he is one of the prime movers in the intelligent design movement. He's at Discovery Institute up in Seattle. Uh, so in the series, he was the professor – uh, and there was a kind of a classroom setting so they could interact. And, uh, and he was going through some, some questions. And the, the main thing is, what is the ultimate reality? You know, what is it that everything else comes from? Yeah. And so the, as we, as a series moves off to a beginning, it's talking about worldviews, kind of the dominant worldview, scientific materialism, in which there's no God, uh, deism, in which there's a God, who's remote but still intelligent and has emotion, rational. Uh, theism, as we have in the Bible, uh, of the creator God who's personal, interacts with his creation, and pantheism where God is in everything and everywhere. Uh, and so the, the kind of the overarching goal was to show that theism is the only logical explanation for why there is something rather than nothing, uh, why there is meaning in the universe, uh, both in explaining the nature of man and the nature of uh, reality that we live in. Yeah. So that that was a, the big one that it starts with. And then it moves its 10 uh, sessions. So obviously 
a lot to cover there. <laughs> right. Yeah. But but some of the ideas we already talked about that uh, the universe has an exi- has a beginning. It hasn't always been there, and therefore there should be a cause. So which of these worldviews can explain the origin of the universe? And it's only theism. All the others fall short. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's powerful. You can't have the universe come into existing out of existence out of nothing right. and have the universe, matter and energy, be responsible for its own origin. Yeah, that's wrong. So scientific materialism is gone. Pantheism has a God that's in everything, so that's that God isn't outside of the, the universe. Uh, and theism and deism are then left standing, uh, with theism being the best choice of those two. Uh, and then from there, moving into the whole aspect of biology and life, where does life come from? Uh, and the total inability of scientific materialism to explain the origin of life. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, pushing it off to someplace else. Well, we can't explain how it came into existence on Earth, but it must have came into existence, come into existence somewhere else and then came to Earth somehow. On the face of it, that's just pushing things off. That's not an explanation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that whole ability to explain the origin of life uh, and recognize that you can have something that's alive right now, an animal, let's say, that dies, right? All the parts are still there for it to be alive, but you can't make it come back to life. It just, it's dead. So it stops functioning. But all the... the, in, on the biological micro level, all the enzymes are still there, the, right? Yep. All the biomolecules are all still there. It's just not functioning. So what is life? Well, life is unique mm-hmm. in the universe. It's not just matter and energy. It's, it's another kind of force, life force that exists that you can't explain materialistically. So the nature of life is is really complex, and it's actually outside of the scope of materialistic explanation because of its nature. Yeah. But living things contain a high degree of information that's integrated and that has a purpose, and all of those are hallmarks of design. So the idea of intelligent design when do we invoke intelligent design? When do we say this is designed versus it's not designed? Has to do with that how much information is there and seeing a pattern. Uh, irreducible complexity is how Michael Behe point, put, puts it in his book, uh, Darwin's Black Box. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Meyer in his book, uh, Signature in the Cell, you know, talks about the whole idea of the the information density and that it actually is a very unlikely event, but it's coupled with an outcome, something that is meaningful that's connected to it. So when we look at things in the real world, we can always tell things that were designed, whether it's these microphones or whatever. Right. You know, they're highly complex, but they have a purpose. Uh, a vehicle that we see, engine in a car, all those things are obviously designed. And when you look at living systems and you say, nope, wasn't designed, you're not being genuine. Right. You're not applying the same rules to every other discussion you have on what was designed and what wasn't designed. And it's only because as soon as you talk about design with living systems, you have to have a designer. As soon as you have to have a designer, those who don't believe in God freak out. Yep, because that means responsibility. Responsibility. So yeah. those are some of the yeah. key topics no, those in that good. series. It's, it's a great series. Uh, recommended to anyone. You can actually purchase it through Focus on the Family and have it as your family. And copy. it is called. Yeah. It's Do you remember? Called, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Yes, I think it's called Faith and Reason. I think it is called yeah. Faith and Reason. Yeah, but okay. It's, it's, a, right. it's a resource that's available yeah. through Focus on the Family. They've got some, lots of uh, uh, video material as well. Right. Uh, if you if you go to YouTube, you can see videos of uh, protein synthesis, mm. uh, and obviously they're not filming proteins being synthesized. So it's a it's an animation, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, an animation of what's going on. And when you see the complexity of that process that's happening over and over in our bodies, just gazillion times every second, uh, the ability of the body to bring the materials together, take these 
uh, biomolecules, proteins and uh, or amino acids, and link them up to build these proteins. Uh, and the checking and rechecking of the DNA, the RNA, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and and you look at that and say, nope, wasn't designed. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was an accident. Well, again, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's the wonder of complexity, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, to see the creativity of God in those things is, Absolutely. is pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah. So, now, Lance, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your answer to this question. I mean, you've you've been in uh, pastoral ministry for, for a couple decades now. You have answered thousands of questions about yep. any number of topics. What are the what are the most frequent questions you get from folks that are kind of related to to faith and science? What are some of the most common ones you've heard of? Yeah, I mean, uh, they all tend to go in the same category. And it's always origin of life. It has to do with evolution versus creation. It has to do with uh, Earth age. It has to do with dinos, right where the dinosaurs Mm -hmm. go. Um, and, uh, more recently, aliens. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. All the questions, they all tend to kind of lump into the same idea of kind of what's out there. And then how do you gel? This is kind of the biggest thing. And I, and I think that, uh, I think this is probably the most confusing area for Christians today. And that is how do you match with what the Bible seems to say with the evidence that's out there? So, for example, um, one of uh, one of our leaders here at the church back in the day, uh, he's a geologist. So his whole training was in geology, and he was examining layers. And the layers are very odd in terms of things are in different layers, and and these layers are not the same with these, and and how long this layer takes to make, and then blah blah blah. Well, it really he's a hardcore believer. Mm-hmm. But he ultimately came up with a rather unusual view of dinosaurs because of the layers and trying to fit the evidence where not only did dinosaurs not walk with man, but they were never alive in the first place, that they were just God created them as fossils because he was trying to understand Mm. the evidence uh, as a geologist of going, well, this cannot be with this. That doesn't work. Um, if the critter was here, it takes a certain amount of, anyway, doesn't matter. But the whole point was, I think that for Christians constantly hearing, this is evidence, this is evidence, this is evidence. Uh, for example, uh, there's Cro-Magnon man. There is all these different things. Where do those fit? Because in the biblical narrative, you don't have half man, half animal. Uh, you don't have that. And so when you hear there is quote unquote and i'm doing air quotes here uh it's hard to <laughs> see on the radio listeners. <laughs> yeah uh where there's evidence how do you match the evidence in i think that is the number one challenge for people and then you end up finding out that the answer on the other side is a lot of evidence that is given is not really evidence at all absolutely and so i, I but that is, i think that is the biggest heart churning because it feels like you you have to Either go the route of science, because they're finding all the evidence, or you have to go the, the route of faith in the Bible, and then somehow you have to make it a Narnia, like some little magical place that doesn't interact with the, the, the evidence out here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think what's so important to have conversations like this is that it starts to bring those two worlds together and yeah. saying, hold on a second. Everything that you're hearing is not exactly how it is. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a that's an interesting segue into uh, the next question I wanted to ask, which is just to bring up the fact that there are uh, obviously a number of people and a number of organizations, a number of organizations with highly trained scientists who are tackling those questions and and coming i mean much like in the secular scientific community in, in some regards coming to a wide range of of mm-hmm. conclusions or even just uh presenting a wide range of of views and i i am by no means an expert on what's out there but just some of the more prominent organizations is you have the the, the institute for creation research which has a pretty uh strict seven literal days you know Correct. creation model and i, I want to say they're young earth creationists is that is that right yeah. okay yeah so pretty strict kind of young earth creationist um philosophy or, or, you know, view there, then you've got, uh, for example, the Discovery Institute, which is technically a secular think tank. I did not know that before <laughs> reading that this week. I'd always thought of them as a, uh, as a uh, faith-based think tank, which they're not, but lots of 
people of faith, not just Christians, are involved right. there and they advocate for, for an intelligent design model. Uh, and then you've got uh, organizations like BioLogos, which is a, a very overtly Christian organization, but they, uh, they're they more on the theistic evolution side of things, right. sort of uh, reconciling, um, seeking to recon, rec, reconcile faith and evolution in that way. That's a diverse <laughs> yeah. range of viewpoints, right? Um, what do you make of all of that? Is is the presentation of such a diverse range of views, uh, is that a good thing? And I, and, and I want to you're welcome to share your view. I think that's fine. But, but that's not really the point of the question. My point is just your, your thought of the range of ways that people of faith are going about seeking to answer these questions. Like, is that a, is that a good thing? Is that a, a challenging thing? What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it keeps the dialogue open. And so there's uh, advantages there. Um, but I think we have to look at the assumptions that each group makes and – so I, I, I wouldn't put them all on an equal footing. Sure. Uh, and going back to what Pastor Lance said, there, there is uh, supposed scientific evidence in certain areas that really isn't evidence at all. Uh, and the most important thing to remember is that according to the Bible, uh, God created the earth. Everything was perfect. He created Adam and Eve, and there was the fall. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have the pre-fall earth we have no real clue as to what it was like. Nope. Because the fall changed a lot. Yes. Uh, in the material world as, as well as the, the spiritual world. And then we have the biblical, biblical account of the global flood. Right. Which as believers, not I guess not all believers believe in a literal global flood. But most do. Most do. Mm-hmm. Uh and so if you believe in a global flood, then that changed the nature of the earth to a point where we have a very hard time knowing what it was like before the flood. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're a secular humanist, if you're a scientific materialist and you don't believe in a global flood, then all of your geological explanations are based upon a non-flood model. Yes. Well, if you have a non-flood model, you come up with very different outcomes from the same observations. And that's where we can reconcile this pretty easily if we recognize that those stated facts are based upon the assumption of no global flood. Then you have to say, well, if I believe in a global flood, then I'm not going to likely be in line with those those conclusions that are stated as fact. Uh, and the other thing that happens with the global flood, if we kind of look at it in all of its aspects, uh, with the likely volcanic activity and seismic activity that occurred, uh, we're going to see a very different results predicted from that model than we will from the uniform formatarian model right. of observations. Uh, so when we think about, you were talking about the, the early man models and yes. so forth, a lot of that has been debunked uh, because the they put together bones that weren't even from the same animals. Mm-hmm. We now have uh, DNA fossils. We have DNA from dinosaur bones, mm-hmm. which can't exist. That DNA can't be viable. It can't exist. If, if it's that old. If it's that old. Uh, so there's just all kinds of evidence out there that points to creation and a more young Earth model uh, and possibly a young universe model. Right. Uh, so certainly with uh, ICR, they're not only young Earth, they're young universe. Right. So they believe mm-hmm. the universe is only like 10,000 years old, okay, mm-hmm. which is a possibility. Sure. Uh, and as believers, I don't think we should uh, let – what appears to be scientific evidence uh, dissuade us from believing what the Bible teaches. And so if we believe the universe is old, we shouldn't believe it's old because we believe we have to have that much time for it to come into existence. We should believe it's old because God created it that way. And it wasn't until I heard your recent sermon on Satan and the fall and Earth that I kind of rethought my universe 
position. I thought, wow, yeah, the universe could be old. God could have created it, and because of the fall of Satan, which is another fall, yeah, uh, things changed, and so then the seven day may be a recreation, yeah, reformation, yeah. reformation, which then is still a little literal interpretation of the Bible. So right. I mean that 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 works for me, yeah. Uh, but the, but the key is uh, when you hear people say that science has proved through evolution that 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 is the model by which life came into existence. That's just not true, right? Because evolution will not allow for the generation of life. Yes, uh, the whole evolutionary model works on living systems right. and mutations and change yes. of living things that's already existent. Right, and so we have a law that we work with all the time called the law of biogenesis. It means that living things come from living things, not yes. from non-living things. And yet, the evolutionist would uh, like you to believe that that law was su- was suspended initially, so that life can come from non-life, and then after that, life only comes from non-life. So it's not mm-hmm. really being consistent, right? Uh, even with their own theory. Yep. No, I hear you. And and as you've always said, it's not that these are bad people. No. Right. It's just they have a faulty set of assumptions. So if you right. believe there's no God and you're looking at the material world and you're thinking that's all there is, then you come up with an idea of how this could all be and you throw your best guess out there and that's your theory. Yes. Okay. So it's a theory based upon, from our perspective, incomplete uh, data. Yes. Not taking into account the creator is a vast mistake, a huge mistake when you're talking about origin of life and origin of matter and energy. Uh, so that's your best explanation. But yeah. if you if you ignore that, you get a different theory. But it's interesting how when we talk theories in chemistry and physics and so forth, theories are models we use to help explain what we're observing. And if that model is no longer functioning adequately, we look to modify it. Yes. And we look to for new models that better explain. So we do chemistry in high school. We use a very simple model of the atom. We get to college. We use a more complex model of the atom because we're trying to explain more things. It's not that one's wrong and the other one's right. It's that this is a simple model. It explains these simple things. Now, here's a more complex one for more complex situations. And we don't we don't talk about right and wrong. So when you look at evolution and you look at all of the information that contradicts the theory and you recognize the inability and the unwillingness to change any part of that theory to accommodate what we now know from the origin of with DNA and protein synthesis, the fact there is no junk DNA. They thought, oh, look, junky DNA, just what we thought. No, it's the operating system that tells the cell how to make proteins. It's not coded for protein synthesis, but it's like the operating system of your computer. It tells the cell how to do everything. Right. It's it's just amazing the information that's there. But rather than look at that and say, "Wow, our we should theories, modify our, our theory is messed up. Right. This isn't working." It's like, "Don't touch our theory." And if you don't believe it, we're not going to fund you anymore. We're going to kick you out. And immediately say, "You know, this isn't science anymore. This has become personal." Yes. Right. And yeah, so that's why, right. that's why there's shouting and there's these yes. debates and this antagonism is because my very personal worldview about God, you know, is strongly held. Yes. And if you've got a worldview just as strongly held over here that you're unwilling to change, then there's conflict. So it appears that science and faith are in conflict, but understanding true science and true faith, yes. they're absolutely not in conflict at all. No, they're compatible. Totally. They're compatible. Yeah. Pastor Bry, uh, r- just going back real quick uh, in the initial part of that question, yeah. what do we do with all these differences? Yeah. In my opinion, I love it. Mm-hmm. I love that there's different camps, yeah. mostly because, uh, as as uh, Dan said, it at least gets the conversation going, yeah. and it allows Christians to say, listen, I'm not trying to run off dogmatic assumptions without assessing the Bible freshly, without looking, what did God really say? Right. Right. I, I love that ability to discuss. I think that's fantastic. But as Dan said, I don't think they're all on the same footing. No. Well, I mean, by definition, they can't be all on the same footing because they, they hold the very sort of, you know, ideas that conflict with one another. It's right. Like, I mean, you just that's kind of the way 
things work when you come to different conclusions. I mean, I what I like about it is that I mean, I am all about removing stumbling blocks to faith. So if you want to talk about a young earth and you want to research a young earth and you want to talk about a literal seven day view, okay, the Institute for Creation Research, like those are your people. Right. Okay, great. You want to talk intelligent design, uh, discovery institutes your people. You want to talk about theistic evolution, which is very different than they, the word they use, which I'd never used, heard this word before until I was on their website earlier this week is evolutionism, which they would describe as like naturalism, which you guys are right. describing. Uh, you want to talk, how do we make sense of a Christian worldview in the midst of an evolutionary worldview? Those are your people. Um, so what we can say is at the end of the day, I'm talking to a non-believer. Let's start with Jesus. Let's start with the fact that he's alive. Right. Let's start with the, you know, I, my interest in getting into debating science with non-believers, first of all, I'm not a professional scientist, so I don't really feel like qualified for the debate. Second of all, my interest in debating you into my camp, which I don't even know if I have a camp because I'm not a trained scientist. <laughs> I, I like the fact that there are Christians across the spectrum. And again, I, I completely agree that they're not all equal. They can't all be equal. And mm -hmm. we could, I mean, even as I was doing my own little research this week, I'm like, just, just as a, a lay, a lay person when it comes to the scientists and as, as a, you know, armchair theologian and, a, and as a pastor, like I find areas of critique with a lot of these approaches. Right. But I'm glad they exist. I'm glad they exist. Even if, even if I would critique some of them because what I don't have to go to somebody and I don't have to start with the like, Hey, let's get all the science stuff settled before we can talk about faith. No, mm -hmm. let's talk about Jesus. And let's, start but I there. think, yeah, I think that's the key, right? So you have the majors and the minors. I still consider this a minor. I understand it's a huge deal, but how God did it is not as important as God is. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's a major versus a minor. Yeah. So listen, I'm going to disagree with you. If you're going to play the theistic evolution route, mm -hmm. I'm, I simply am not going to work because I don't yeah. believe it fits the biblical model, yeah. but that is not where we're going to die on that hill. I'm much more interested in who Jesus is. And that's a debate for you to have with another believer, right? Like, Absolutely. So, which is, which is different than, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. That's a great thing for believers to wrestle with. Yes. But it's not like that. Uh, to me, at least, that's not your starting point. Nope. With, you know. Anyway. Well, if you derail Jesus because we're <laughs> arguing about theory, we have a problem. Yeah, that's I right. feel like we've we've put the cart well, before the horse there. That's like like that's I feel like that's not like yeah. a big enough analogy there. Right. And I so, think that I think that uh, the intelligent design camp and the uh, Institute for Creation Research can be can be can coexist. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, even though the ICR people kind of are, well, just, <laughs> chair, chair just went down a little bit. I don't know. Adjust, adjust, adjust your microphone. That's probably adjust easier. My mic. There we go. I just got much shorter. All right. <clears throat> uh, the uh, ICR people, you know, tend to oppose intelligent design just because they don't identify the designer. Uh, but they're serving a different purpose. Yes. They're working in a secular environment. Uh, so the biologos people, the ICR people don't have any use for them at all. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's because of their basic premise. Yeah. Uh, of, of theistic evolution. So, but, but for, an, for an individual we're, we're working with, uh, bringing Jesus to them, that's important. When they, if we have someone who is actually scientifically trained, who's having a problem understanding, yes how God could be the creator, Yes. Uh, then I think these resources are really beneficial. Very. But I, absolutely. But I know for some believers, uh, they absolutely don't want to have anything to do with apologetics. Hmm. They just, it's like, I read in the Bible, it's true, <laughs> God's the creator, and I don't, I want to have any discussions about this. Don't, don't bother me with any of that. I am perfectly content where I am, and I don't want to learn anything. And I think that's why fewer people went to the faith and reason than you would expect out of Bridgeways. Because a lot of believers like, hey, I'm good. Yeah. You know? They don't care about the how. I yeah. Don't, yeah. It's it's not important to me. Yeah. And the only reason maybe for them it should be important is in case they interact with a non believer who has questions, they can have some reasonable answers. Yes. Otherwise they may come across as, well, to a non-believer, uh, it's in the Bible, and I believe it, and that sells it for me. And for the other person, say, "Wow, I've got questions." Yeah, you know, yes. if, if that's Certainly the deal, true. it sounds like the faith and reason. It's like you've got faith, 
Where's your reason? Yeah, you got to have both. Yeah. yeah. Well, and how beautiful is it to be able? I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes. And 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 to to dig into that and to understand. I mean, that is such a beautiful sentence. And to affirm that and to say, let's look at this world that God has made, which He and His common grace has given us the tools to understand it. A lot of what you've described throughout this last hour, right. Dan. I think that's wonderful. And I think wonderful. that again, it can be an occasion for for worship. It can be an occasion for understanding, and and like you said, it can be something that adequately prepares us for apologetics type conversations. Right. You know, with with uh, with nonbelievers. So no, that's great. Um, well, we're getting to the end of our time here. This has been a, a, a tremendous conversation. I feel like this last question, we've kind of already answered it from a few different angles. But I just want to give you a chance again in, in case, especially for you, Dan, but even for you, Lance, if there's anything that you're kind of wanting to, to share with our listeners before we end the episode. Um, Dan, we'll start with you. W- what do believers most need to understand when it comes to science and faith? They need to understand that there's no conflict between true science and true faith. Yeah, that's so There's good. There's no conflict. That's great. No, I appreciate you? that. I, I, you know, I, I was just jotting down some notes here. Science reveals stuff through human lenses, right? So you explained, Dan, that it explains what we observe. Right. Okay, but that's a human lens. You observe something. Science reveals that stuff. It doesn't prove stuff in that way. Faith, I, I think that's important for people to understand, is not just hope. It's holding on to what God says. Mm-hmm. Um, hope is, man, I just, I hope that something is going to happen. So I think that defining our terms is important. Um, but faith and reason, I think they go completely hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And then the only other thing that I would say in closing is any discussion of purpose and meaning automatically involves God. Mm -hmm. I I don't, there is Mm -hmm. no other way to have any discussion about meaning or purpose without an outside deity. I just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I think that it is it is false for a scientist to say there is purpose and meaning if God is completely removed from the situation. Right. I it's, don't it's understand. Yeah. It's yeah. disingenuous. So I think what they want is they want uh, just enough God until the point of responsibility. <laughs> and then so that, I think that's why they push it off. Right. right. They got to push it into a corner where there might be some type of gaudy thing over there, yeah. but it's certainly not something I have to answer to. It's like ethics and, and morality. Yes. You know, right. From the scientific perspective, there is absolutely no explanation for that. No. So how, so how do you explain? And, and why should we be ethical? Why should we be moral? Yes. Uh, you know, if it's only an individual interpretation, then how can there be moral outrage if there are no moral absolutes? Absolutely. So unless you have God and God's moral absolutes, then there's no reason for morality. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, too many atheists aren't digging deep enough. What they'll say is they'll look at current society and say, well, it works for us. That's why we do it. And you go, you're not digging deep enough <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff you need to do that does not work for you. Right. That's yeah. called morality. Yeah. It yeah. actually violates the very <laughs> oh, concept. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if you're if yeah, you're only looking right. out for yourself, then you would steal and you yes. would you would do whatever you wanted to because that would look out for you. Yep. And from a evolutionary, biolistic, bio, biological, evolutionary perspective, that would be perfectly acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well good. said. I think also I, I, this is so simple, but it's it's such a I don't know kind of a guiding principle for me is just that. It's it's a beautiful world that God has made, and it's a beautiful oh. universe that God is that God has made, and it is, it is a gift from God that we have the opportunity to see it, to explore it, to learn about it, to see how the different things work. Again, whether it's the little tiny things or the or the really big things, right. and those can that can always be an opportunity for worship. And something that I'm going to teach my kids as they grow older, and I have no idea, you know, I was never that interested in science, but, you know, their grandfather's a, a doctor, so maybe they will be. But uh, <laughs> I, I will always tell them, you have nothing to fear from learning about the world that God has made. Amen. That the world that, that, that you can dig into scientific inquiry, and there is absolutely nothing to fear. And it is it is only something that is going to show you more of who God is and the world that he has made. And that is beautiful, and that is wonderful. And, man, I'll walk alongside you as you're young, especially, to to kind of help you make sense of some of this stuff. But it's fantastic. And I, and, and I think on the flip side of that, too, um, you talk about having nothing to fear. I'd say that to, to a non-believer 
if you're really going to get get into these questions of origins, if you're really going to get into these questions of, okay, maybe there is something behind this, that from a Christian worldview, you have nothing to fear as well. Psalm 1611, you have, make known, you have made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are, ple- are pleasures forevermore. That the creator we believe that is behind this is good, and he makes known to us the path of life. So, so whatever side of this you are on, right. you have nothing to fear. Nothing to so, fear. And, and, you know, pardon the cliche, but all truth is God's truth. And Amen. That's a, Amen. that's a good thing. So, uh, Dan, thank you so much for the time today. This was wonderful. Really, really appreciate uh, you taking some time to chat with us. Uh, it was great. Thank you. So, and thanks to you, Lance. But, you know, you're here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. Uh, yes. Indeed it is. Well, and thank you uh, to you for listening. We sure appreciate it. Uh, once again, hope this provokes some good thoughts and uh, conversation for you. would encourage you to talk over the content of this episode with somebody else if that would be helpful to you. If you enjoyed what you heard, please go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. It just takes a second and helps us get this to more people. We look forward to being with you next time on the next episode of Engaging Culture. Thank you for listening to Engaging Culture, a podcast by Bridgeway Christian Church. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Music is used under the Creative Commons license and is provided by Dexter Britton.